There's no defeat in Christ Jesus. The title of the message is, Taking Steps of Faith to Climb Higher in the Lord. When people gather here, it's spiritually oriented. And we bring messages before you to feed you spiritually, to keep you focused on what's most important. That is spiritual growth, your responsibility before the Lord. Why do we do this service after service? Because this world is full of distractions. And if the devil can't get you to sin, he's going to try to distract you. He's going to try to use the cares of life to choke out the Word of God in your life so that your life will end up being unfruitful before the Lord, displeasing to Him, and then you don't make heaven one day. And part of our responsibility as little shepherds over the flock is to feed you the Word, to continually pour it into you so that you are nourished spiritually, well-fed spiritually, and as you take matters into your own hands, in your own personal lives, you grow in the Lord with the goal of becoming and growing into the stature of Christ. You say, impossible. That's not what the Word says. The Word says otherwise. That is our standard. The starting scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. You can't please God without faith. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Divine faith, as you've been taught, is a gift from God. The Bible says to every man is given a measure of faith. So when you are born into this world, God has already imparted in you a certain measure of divine faith. So no one can say, I don't have any faith. That's not true. It contradicts the word of God. Everyone has at least one measure. What separates people is what they do with that measure moving forward. Now Paul, by this measure I should say, by this measure every person comes to Calvary to receive a born-again experience. That's how degraded sinners can come to Calvary by faith and be miraculously transformed into new creations. It's through that measure of faith. Without it, it wouldn't happen. So everyone has that measure of faith. Paul wrote in Romans about salvation, that born-again experience. It's twofold. There's two parts to receiving a born-again experience. Number one, confession with the mouth is made unto salvation. Two, and most importantly, and with the heart a person believes unto righteousness. This is the most important part. Because down through the years, many people in the midst of God's true people have made a confession. People even may have witnessed them make a confession. But what people miss is they can't see the heart. So a person can make a confession, but they don't believe in their heart unto righteousness unto God's holiness. So they go about professing they're born again, they're saved, but yet they never believe truly in their heart unto righteousness. So their life and the fruits of their life don't match up to what the Bible says is a child of God. And people have questions about that. No, all you have to do is go back to the basics, the Word of God, and see for yourself. When a person does not change and become a new creation, that means they may have confessed, but they didn't believe in their heart. And only God can see the heart. Man can't. Now, as a child of God, our lives are ordained by God to please Him. But without faith in operation, you're not going to do that. Therefore, as the Word says, we must learn to live by faith. Meaning, during our Christian life, our faith must increase by adding more measures of faith to that initial measure God gave us to start. Remember the starting verse, God rewards those who diligently seek Him? 
To be diligent means to be steady, earnest, energetic. Does this describe your relationship with God? You know, people tend to be more diligent about things that they love and care about. If a person loves God with all their heart, mind, and soul, if they possess first love for Christ as they're supposed to, then they will be steady, earnest, and energetic in seeking more of God. Is this not true? This is just reasoning. Seeking more of his knowledge and wisdom. Seeking more of his grace. More of his faith. This is what Paul called faith to faith. Okay? Faith to faith, meaning you're growing in faith. You're adding more faith. You're increasing your measures of faith that you may then grow and spiritually mature with the goal of becoming Christ-like. Spiritual growth and maturity is like physical growth and maturity. Growing from a little baby to a toddler to a young boy into adulthood. Growth doesn't happen instantly. It's a process. But this spiritual growth, this process requires diligence and patience. In your patience, possess your soul. As you diligently and patiently seek the Lord and serve Him, you will grow and mature. You will become more and more Christ-like than what you were when you first started the journey. And I'm not talking free from sin, I'm talking Christ-like in nature. Christ-like in thinking. You will become more Christ-like in sacrifice, in doing for the Lord. Now, it's important to note, talking about growth, relating, parallel, making the parallel between physical growth and spiritual growth. You know, when you physically grow up in your body, you can experience growing pains. I'm sure many of you out there, when you were growing up, you experienced those growing pains in your limbs, in your body. You ached. Maybe it got so disturbing, your parents took you to a doctor, and the doctor said, these are just growing pains. Well, you know what? Spiritually speaking, as we grow, you know what? We experience growing pains. For as a child of God grows in the Lord, this will happen. And these growing pains, you can relate them to the tribulations and the tests and the trials of this life. But remember, these growing pains will not kill you. Oh, when you feel them, you may think you're dying. But you're not. You're growing. These are signs of growth. And as you grow in the Lord, in His knowledge and wisdom, as you grow in His grace, as you grow in faith, you will be tried and tested. God allows it. Jesus promised it. Because all of this promotes spiritual growth. With every measure of faith added, that measure will be tried. It will be tested. The Lord's goal in all of this, in this journey of life, in adding measures of faith, the goal is for His children to not remain spiritual babes, but to grow up into spiritual maturity. To possess the same measures of faith that the saints of old possessed. Saints that we read about in the Word of God, who God was able to use, who they sacrificed in great ways for the sake of souls and for the sake of the Lord. To grow into such spiritual maturity as the saints of old. 
to grow into the stature of Christ. Jude 1.3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you or compel you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. He's writing, this, this is not an option. He's telling you, this is what you must do once you've received the common salvation. You must earnestly contend. Earnestly means sincere, intense conviction. Contend means to fight and struggle. Now, does this sound like an easy process to obtain such faith? Contend, fighting and struggling? Sincere, intense conviction? No. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And if we grow into Christ's stature, we too will overcome. That's why we can have good cheer in, in the midst of such times. To every child of God, I ask, how sincere are you in your relationship with the Lord? If you're not sincere about your spiritual growth, you'll come up short in this life and in the next. Now, at this time, I want to go back to where I opened the service. And I want to paint a picture in your mind. And I want you to have this picture throughout the rest of the message. Think of a long, tall staircase representing your journey to heaven. And each step up this staircase, you're taking on an additional measure of faith. Now, when you receive the born-again experience, you are using that initial measure given you by God. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift unto people, but to receive this gift, it is done by a person accepting the gift through their measure of faith God gave them. So think of it this way. A sinner is not on this staircase that leads to heaven. Only children of God. So when you receive salvation, when you become born again, you're taking that first step up the staircase leading to heaven. You're using that initial measure of faith God gave you to receive salvation. The first step. The first of what is to be many steps. Romans 1.17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Think of it this way, step by step, faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Living by faith is taking steps on this stairway that leads to heaven. Living by faith in the Word of God. For a child of God, this life is a faith journey. Every step you climb is to be a faith step. And every faith step you climb, you climb higher to God, towards God, closer to God, more reality in God. You see, it's not enough to become born again, to receive the Holy Ghost baptism. These two gifts from God... What they do for a person, in reality, is start you on a journey of spiritual growth. These two gifts from God set your feet on the stairway that leads to heaven. But you're at the bottom. You've taken the first step, but where are you going to go from here? As Paul wrote, these steps that you climb... Faith to faith, step by step, this is what will reveal the righteousness of God in your life. It won't be revealed by what you proclaim, by what you profess. Your life will reveal the righteousness of God. Faith to faith, step by step in your spiritual growth. With each step you climb, again, more measures of faith are added unto you. With each step you climb, you are growing higher, going higher, 
drawing closer to God, becoming stronger in Him. With each step you climb, you receive more grace, more of God's favor into your life. Because you're adding faith, you're diligently seeking Him. With more grace, you have more answers to your prayers. With more grace, your needs are supplied. Each step you climb, you are able to do more for God. Making your life more profitable unto the kingdom. Enabling you in your personal life to please God in greater ways. Doing more for Him, winning more souls for Him. Again, each step you climb is spiritual growth. Now, we have been taught about faith in this Jesus ministry. That in our walk with the Lord, there will be different times in our life, different situations that we face, that we will need a, those additional measures of faith in order to reach God for whatever it is we're facing. Additional measures of faith will be needed to accomplish certain things for the Lord. Otherwise, it won't be done. Thus, we've been taught to earnestly contend for the faith. The just shall live by faith. Such a simple yet important revelation in the Word of God. But yet, so many Christians in the world, they overlook this important truth. And they fail to apply it to their daily life. Never learning to spiritually grow. Never learning to climb the steps of faith to receive more measures. But if you don't take steps to climb, you won't spiritually grow. You will remain continually in a spiritually weak and immature place in God's kingdom, which displeases God. If you don't take steps to climb, you miss out on many blessings and benefits that could have been yours from the Lord. But because you refuse to make the effort, because you would not diligently seek God, thus God does not reward you. How often has a person come into the kingdom? And I've seen it down through the years and 28 years of ministry. People come into the kingdom and by faith they took that first step up the stairway leading to heaven when they were born again. Then they stopped and proceeded no further. Whether it was weeks, months, or even years, they took the first step and they took no more steps. They stood at the bottom of the staircase, so to speak. And it's as if they believed God had nothing more to offer. That the stairway to heaven was actually just all one step. People climb no higher in the Lord because they're either unaware that there are more steps to be taken, more faith to be added, or they know this, but they deceive themselves and they're content with where they're at. They're content standing at the bottom of the staircase, not reaching, not climbing for more of God, not seeking to go higher and deeper in Him. Time passes, no efforts made, remaining at the bottom of the staircase, never climbing, never drawing closer to God, never understanding really what it means to please God in their life. And their actions pretty much dictate they don't even care about that. You can say such a spiritual condition is being lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot. There they stand on the staircase. They're not climbing up. They're not stepping off the staircase. They're just idle, lukewarm. Spiritually satisfied where they're at. Focused primarily on this physical world, not on the spiritual. In such a place, sooner or later something will happen in life. 
trouble, tribulation arises, maybe a trial of the faith will suddenly present itself before them. But being weak in faith, never having learned to climb higher in the Lord, never adding more measures of faith, they don't understand what is happening in that moment of test. So they become offended. And instead of being rooted and grounded in the love and faith of God, they are uprooted. Instead of going up, they turn around and they go down. Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. No living by faith means no righteousness of God revealed. Consider that statement. If you're not living by faith, the righteousness of God is not being revealed and manifested in your life. In a lukewarm condition, all that is left in the life is a form of godliness and no power, just form. Now I want to take you to Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verses 15 and 16. Here Jesus is dictating letters, messages to certain churches in Asia. Think of that. There are people in these churches that Jesus is speaking directly to, through John the Apostle. And in Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, Jesus speaking to a certain church, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You ever have something in your mouth that tasted so foul, so rank, you just spit it out? Maybe it almost made you sick. I'm usually careful with what I eat. But there are times you put something in your mouth that you just, you get it out. Spit it out as fast as you can, as forcefully as you can. That's what Jesus is telling this church. These people in his church. You have left such a bad spiritual taste in my mouth. Even though you're in the, my church, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth if you don't change. That's how disgustingly revolting they taste in his mouth. Jesus is chastising his church at Laodicea for their lack of spiritual growth. He knew their works, that their works were towards earthly gain, not spiritual gain. The focus of these Christians in the Laodicean church was physical well-being and material prosperity. They cared very little for the spiritual well-being and spiritual prosperity that Jesus so cared about. What did it result in? This church was blind to their spiritual condition. They had no idea how Jesus viewed them. This people could not see themselves as Christ saw them. This people in the church did not measure their spiritual spirituality with the Word of God. You know how they measured their spirituality? By the earthly wealth they had possessed. That's how they measured it. They thought, well, all my needs are satisfied here. God has blessed me abundantly. I am well off. I have need of nothing. But Jesus appears to John to set the church straight. Revelation 3, 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, 
and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? Could Jesus have described them any worse? This is not a person doing it. This is Jesus speaking of his own church. He let them know how wrong they were. Through the lens of truth, Jesus reveals you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. Revelation 3, 18 and 19. Again, Jesus, I counsel thee. Now here the Lord's going to try and help the church. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, be diligent, and repent. So he's telling his own church to repent. They're not even ready for heaven. Let's start right there. They're not ready for heaven. Telling them to repent. Now he loves them. He gave his life for them. He wanted to help them, so again I say he's offering counsel. He's offering them help. So let's go into this a little more, this counsel that he offers. What is this help he's offering them? Well, to start, unfortunately, this church being so physically oriented, focused on possessions and wealth, they have carnal minds. So the Lord can't speak to them directly on about spiritual things. To get their attention, he's got to speak in the realm of earthly things. Buying gold tried with fire. He knew that would get their attention. But he's not talking of earthly gold. No. This church lacked divine faith. Faith that is tried and tested and purified by the trials of life. This church had not been taking steps of faith to climb higher and grow stronger in the Lord. They were content, lukewarm at the bottom of the staircase, so to speak. 1 Peter 1.7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Next, he offers, buy of me white raiment. White raiment. What's the significance? In Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8, John sees the bride in heaven. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. The bride has made herself ready. The bridal company members are ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That fine linen that the bridal company members wear at the supper. That fine linen that Jesus offered his own church represents faith. It speaks of the righteousness of the saints. Well, according to the scriptures, how is the righteousness of God revealed in our life? Made manifest in our life? How is it? By faith. Faith to faith. Herein is the righteousness of God made manifest, faith to faith. This church, oh, so lacked faith. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. What is the cure for spiritual blindness? What will destroy the scales of deceit covering a person's eyes? Truth, and only truth. The eye salve of God's Word. And what does God's Word do for us? 
Romans 10:17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Everything Jesus offered this church in counsel to help them, this lukewarm church, it was all faith-based. The church at Laodicea was Christ's church. They were in his mouth. They started in faith, but they never continued in faith. Climbing and taking steps. Seeking to spiritually grow up and mature in the Lord. Instead, they became distracted by the cares of life. So any of the word that did get into them, it became unfruitful anyway. Being choked out. After so long, this church becomes lukewarm, possessing only a form of godliness. And it left such a bad taste in Jesus' mouth that he's ready to spew them out and be done with them. Romans chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Again, child of God, you cannot please God without faith. You must live by faith so that the righteousness of God may be revealed in your life. So it's time to start climbing steps of faith. It's time to start adding measures of faith. It's not an option. All this hinges upon your trust and faith in what God says in his word. All this hinges in how much you truly love God. And if Christ is first love in your life or not. Earnestly contend and climb. And again, to go up a long, tall staircase, it takes effort. It takes effort, but God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The higher you climb, the greater of a blessing you will become. Every step brings more of God into your nature. But some Christians, some people that go to church, the problem is they're completely satisfied with their own personal nature. But just because you are, or other people are, doesn't mean that the Lord is. The Lord wants his children to take on the nature of his son. And to keep adding and keep adding. And this is why God appoints ministers, shepherds over the flock, to feed them his word so that they may whet the appetite, take in the word and start growing, even on their own. We can't do all the growing for you. We can't do all the feeding for you. We're only here three times a week for a few hours. But every day of the week, seven days a week, there's 24 hours in each day. So a lot of the growth is independent. But we will do our part, rest assured. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. All of this is growth. All of this goes towards growth, spiritual growth and maturity. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, spiritual growth, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Again, spiritual growth. After his resurrection, Jesus commanded Peter, Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And that's what he did. Finally, he took it to heart. Teaching. The church, how to climb higher in the Lord. And not only that, he instructed them how to do it. And I want to take you to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 
whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. How are they given to us? In the Word. That by these, by the Word of God, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, the Christ nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God gave us His Word, and by faith in His Word, children of God take on that divine nature. As they abide in the Word and Christ abides in them, they take on the divine nature, separated from the, the corruption, the sin, the deceit in the world, the lust of the world. And this is taking steps of faith to climb higher in the Lord. I continue, 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7. And beside this, give all diligence. There's that word again. Add to your faith virtue. Again, think of these as taking steps. You're climbing higher. Add to your faith virtue. Taking a step. And to virtue, knowledge. Taking another step. And to knowledge, temperance. You're climbing higher. And to temperance, patience. You're moving closer to God. And to patience, godliness. You're becoming more Christ-like. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Peter instructs, be diligent. Don't rest on your laurels. laurels. Don't be satisfied taking one step up this stairway. It's time to start climbing. It's time to start adding, taking steps in the Lord, becoming stronger, more mature in the Lord. Make sure, he's telling them, make sure these wonderful divine ingredients are being added to your nature. Because when you add these ingredients to your nature, you, be, you are becoming more Christ-like. 2 Peter 1.8 For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you climb higher in your life, like a branch on the vine Jesus, you will not be spiritually barren but you must grow. You will not be unfruitful, but you must grow. It's a shame that many people come into the kingdom. They'll take that first step, and they'll never climb. Never go higher. Never go deeper. Never grow stronger and more mature. They never become more Christ-like. They can, they can attend church, for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years and never become more Christ-like. Peter warns of this in 2 Peter 1.9. But he that lacketh these things, again, not growing, not taking steps, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, just like Jesus told the church, spiritually blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Child of God, if you don't start climbing, if you don't start seeking God, and adding these godly qualities to your life, what this will result in, your complacency, your lack of spiritual growth, it will lead to spiritual blindness. You will become full of ingratitude, having forgotten what Jesus has done for you. When that moment that you got saved, washed clean of all your sins, made a new creature, that place of gratitude and humility that you once were when you knelt at the foot of the cross, you've lost it. It's gone, it's out of your spirit, and it's out of your mind. Forgotten the love and the mercy and the grace that was displayed unto you as a sinner by God and Jesus. As I say, you become like the church at Laodicea, blind to yourself. With a spirit of ingratitude, you're lukewarm. 
No desire to add more of God to your life. No desire to climb higher and draw closer to God. You're lukewarm. You're self-satisfied. But now I want to take you back to the book of Revelation, to the church in Philadelphia. That word means brotherly love. So by this name, we understand that this church has no issue or lack of love. And it says in Revelation 3, 8, Jesus speaking, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. The key phrase in this description, they kept the word. That says it all. To keep his word, you have to study the word, know it, and obey it. So that little phrase says it all right there. They kept his word. This church was spiritually focused on Jesus, and they were focused on becoming more like him. This church was not like the other. They were not entangled with this physical world and its wealth and riches. This church stood for truth. Keeping Jesus' word, obeying it, living by faith in it. And as a result, what that meant for the church, unfortunately, the Philadelphia church did not appeal to most people. So therefore, they had little strength. Oh, most of the people gravitated to the other church, the rich and wealthy church. The, the church that was focused on being popular and wealthy and having all of their physical needs supplied. Yet the Philadelphia church, by the grace of God, Christ put before them an open door that this world could not shut. Revelation 3.10, Jesus continues, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, there it is again, they kept the word. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Jesus is saying, because you kept my word, you obeyed my love commandments, you sought to do my will, you patiently, diligently climbed and grew stronger and more mature and more Christ-like, I will come again. To receive you unto myself so that you may be with me forever. To escape the great tribulation period when God's wrath will be poured out all over the earth to try humanity. Revelation 3.11 Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now we do not know the hour or the day of Jesus' return, but we do know this is the season. And when he comes, it will be quick. He just said so. Paul wrote it would be so quick in the twinkling of an eye. That's how quick. But Jesus warns his coming is so quick. And the reason he warns this is because it's so fast, you have to get ready and stay ready. And you better hold fast to what you have that I've given you. Because my coming will be so quick, there'll be no time to get ready if you're lacking. When I come and you're lacking, it's too late. That's how quick his coming will be. No delays, no timeouts, no time to make ready. Get ready, stay ready for his coming. This is an age of great deceit. Let no man take your crown. Jesus and Paul prophesied it would be. People, sinners and Christians alike will be deceived in this great seduction because there's going to be a great falling away from truth. People will fall away from truth sitting in church. Let no man take your crown. Jesus said there would be false Christs and false prophets demonstrating great signs and wonders that if it was even possible, the very elect would be deceived by them. 
Paul wrote the last days would be so perilous, so dangerous, because of how society has devolved and what it becomes. And we're seeing that happening even in our own society of America, how dangerous it's becoming. But there's the falling away from truth. People are rejecting sound doctrine. Even so-called Christians, they don't want to hear the Bible because a lot of them don't believe, really, that the Bible's the infallible Word of God. But this Bible has been thousands of years in the making. This Bible, how many societies and civilizations for thousands of years have, try, have tried to destroy it? But God would not let it happen because it is His Word. And the truth will always prevail, whether man accepts it or not. So people today may not value God's Word, but nonetheless, God has proven and demonstrated He values it. And we must value it accordingly. Now, more and more, people are just taking on a form of godliness. Assuming there's something in Christ that they're not. They're just assuming. And assuming is the lowest form of knowledge. And the only way you're going to know who you are in Christ is you by, by looking into the mirror of the Word. How often do you physically look in the mirror each and every day? Before, whether it's in the morning before you leave the house, during the day, maybe when you use the restroom at a public facility. How often do you look in the mirror to make sure you are in order? Nothing's out of place. Well, don't you know that your spiritual person is way more important than your physical person? So how often daily do you look into the mirror of the Word to make sure that you are spiritually in place? That does nothing out of place. To make it to heaven in these perilous times, you have to keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hold fast to the Word, because it's your only safety. Hold fast to the Word and earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. One saint, in particular Noah, because we're in the same kind of days that Noah lived. He had that faith that diligence, and that patience. Over 120 years he worked, but deliverance came. Hebrews 11, 5 and 6, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. He was raptured and was not found because God had translated him. Why did God translate him? For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That's how you're going to get raptured. He pleased God. Verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Friend, listening to this message today, is your life pleasing God? Not by your own personal opinion, do you know whether or not your life is pleasing God according to His Word? Are you living by faith? Are you, as I described in the message, climbing this staircase leading to heaven, making diligent effort, faith to faith, step by step, adding measures of faith, more faith becoming stronger, becoming more Christ-like in nature? And I ask you, most importantly, which church do you belong? Go back into Revelation chapter 3. Study the church of Laodicea and the church of Philadelphia. Which church do you belong? And I'm not speaking of the physical churches. Those churches are long gone, oh, 2,000 years ago. I speak of the spirit of each church. 
Which church do you belong? Which spirit of the church abides in you? Does the spirit of the Philadelphia church abide in you? Or does the church or the spirit of the Laodicean church abide within you? It's important to know. Through truth and the spirit of truth, these things can be revealed to you. If you want to know truth and you diligently seek God, He will show it. And maybe you're watching today. Maybe there are people here today. You realize and understand, even as this message was being delivered, that there is a lack. A spiritual lack in your life. A lack of growth, maturity. A lack of faith. It's time to start climbing. And if your life has any sin, any disobedience, if your life has been displeasing to God in any way, it's time to make it right with God. And it's time to start climbing. It's time to start that journey of pleasing God and diligently seeking Him. Because one day, the staircase will end. One day, Jesus will return. And we'll find ourselves at the top, having made the journey. But it takes effort on each person's part. Pray this prayer with me right now. Say, O oh God, save my soul. Forgive me, Lord, for sinning against you, for failing you, for displeasing you in any way. I am so sorry, but I will serve you, Lord, the rest of my life. I will start the climb to heaven. And I believe there is power in the blood of Jesus that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. And amen. And friend, if you meant that prayer, again, not just the confession, but if you believed in your heart, the Lord is yours. Salvation is yours. You took that first step. Use that initial measure of faith God gave you. And now let God do more for you by faith. Faith in the word of God that says a believer would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. I'm the Lord's believer, Reverend Steve Millar here. It's the Lord's believer. Many believers are ready now to pray for you, to look to the Lord for you. So by faith, put your hand against mine on the screen. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I bring the people before you. God, we honor the blood, that blood sacrifice at the whipping post by which we have healing of every sickness and of every disease. God, lay a healing hand upon each one. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal, heal them now. Let the healing virtue from the blood flow right to where they are. And Lord, pour it out upon them. Heal them, deliver them, break every bondage, supply every need for your honor and glory by Christ Jesus' sacrifice. In the blood name of Jesus, and amen. And watch every sign of improvement and give God praise, honor, and glory. And let others know, for God's glory, what God has done for you. And you need the Holy Ghost. Another important step in this journey. The Holy Ghost living within you will be a guide, a teacher, and a comforter as you take this journey by faith. He will be there to direct your steps in faith. But before I minister to you for the Holy Ghost, if anyone here is in need of prayer, this is your opportunity to go over to the side, and I'll meet you over there to minister to you. And the rest of you, stand to your feet. Come to the altar today. Let the Lord bless you. Let Him anoint you. Let the Holy Spirit move for you this day in the name of Jesus. And those of you online, I want to encourage you you need the Holy Ghost. You may be at church today or at home, wherever you may be. Stand to your feet as well. Lift up your hands unto the Lord. I'm going to ask the Lord to anoint you, that you will receive His gift of the Holy Ghost. And you start praising the Lord. You start glorifying Jesus. And as you do that, the Holy Ghost will move in. And when He comes in to baptize you, 
He'll take over your tongue. Those praises will change. And you will begin to speak in an unknown language. And that signifies the Holy Ghost has come in to take over. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring this people before you now. God, to anoint them. Anoint them to receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, I call the anointing down upon them to receive the Holy Ghost. God, do anoint them to receive your precious gift of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Ghost. Start praising the Lord, glorifying Jesus. Let the Holy Ghost come in. Let him move for you this day. And everyone here, let the Holy Ghost have his way. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Glorifying Jesus. Praise in the King. Love in Jesus. Glorifying Jesus. Praise in the King. Glorifying Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Praise in Jesus. Love in Jesus. Lifting up those praises. Lifting up those praises. Just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Praise in the King. Praise in Jesus. Jesus, love in Jesus, glorify in Jesus, praise in the King. Yes, let him bless you, let him bless you, glorify in Jesus, praise in Jesus, praise in Jesus, love in Jesus. Love in Jesus, yes. Praise Him with your whole heart. Praise Him with your whole heart. Glorify in Jesus. Praise in the King. Praise in the King. Others will 